Well, good morning everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, depending what time you're actually sitting down to watch this. Okay, listen to this. Jehovah is a wonderful God of comfort and relief. In stark contrast, Satan the devil is a horrible God of pain and suffering. In fact, if we think about it, even the so-called uh, natural disasters that cause a lot of pain and suffering, Satan is the ultimate cause. Why do we say that? Well, by alienating humans from Jehovah, uh, Satan deprived them of the Creator lovingly controlling the weather for their benefit. Additionally, humans under Satan's rule have grossly mismanaged the earth and its environmental provisions, uh, resulting in erratic weather swings, which undoubtedly contributes to these so-called natural disasters. Right, okay. <laughs> in, in the 28 years that I was a Jehovah's Witness, I never ever heard anybody come out with um, a claim like that. Uh, I never heard it. And, and uh, when I was a witness, they, they, you used to have um, some brothers who would go to a kingdom hall, usually not their own congregation, because <laughs> usually they couldn't get away with it in their own congregation. So that your visiting speaker would, would go to your, uh, your kingdom hall. And sometimes they'd said something completely off script with no support, uh, biblical support. And afterwards you'd be going, did, did, did you, did I pick that guy up right? Did he really say that? And yeah. Or you may hear that uh, Brother Rogue Elder had said something of visiting another congregation. And then next thing to get spread, did you hear that an elder went to a congregation, you know, locally and said this? Are you sure? Oh, I absolutely, because his talk was recorded for Sister Not Very Well. And I've heard it. Yet yeah, this isn't a case of Brother Rogue Elder. This was from a speech given six months ago or, or, or less at the annual general um, meeting of Jehovah's Witnesses by none other than Stephen Rubberface Lett. So basically what he's trying to do is trying to deflect as he does, the Jehovah's Witnesses do, and other religious organisations do, uh, deflect from um, the God of the Bible owning up to having um, uh, blood guilt uh, on his hands for the amount of deaths that occur from a natural disaster. Because what he does after uh, he says that, he goes on to, you know, going about how wonderful Jehovah's Witnesses are when it comes to coming to the assistance <coughs> of those who have been affected by a natural disaster. And he does a sort of before and after where you see somebody's little house. And I, when I say little, honestly, uh, my next door neighbor's garage is bigger than some of these people's houses. And, and I'm not joking. I'm not joking, because a lot of these natural disasters sadly occur with, uh, in the areas of the world where, where the most poorest people live. They, they've got nothing, they've, you know, a little bit of cattle, a little bit of land, a really small house, a massive family, and um, when they're affected by natural disasters, you know, they, they can't stand up to, you know, tornadoes and hurricanes and you know, flooding, tsunamis, no chance at all. And so you, you see the before and after, how all of a sudden, you know, it, it hears that, you know, a, a country or a city or, or a district has been devastated. And it's affected by the Jehovah's Witnesses in the area. All of a sudden the call goes out and it's in gears, you know, the, the, the rescue team go in to try and rebuild these guys' lives. And you see the before and after where you see, you know, so, you know the remains of a <coughs> something that looks like a garage and now it looks more like a garage and there's still no window, is that somebody's house? Where you can see a, um, a kingdom hall which looks like <clears throat> maybe a slightly bigger garage, knocked down but now it's been rebuilt, it's fantastic. And of course the, the witnesses are, are patting themselves on the back. But at the end of the day is what Let, what Rubberface Let comes out to say is, is that um, over the past two years, 64, uh, it's either 62 or 64, I can't remember, I'm not interested, but it's over 60 Jehovah's Witnesses 
were killed <clears throat> in these natural disasters. You can rebuild houses, you can replant crops, you can buy you know, new cattle or animals, you can rebuild kingdom walls, but what you can't do is bring somebody back from the dead. In other words, once they're gone, that's it, there's no coming back. And of course, people who were directly affected by bereavement in these countries must be thinking to themselves, well, hold on a second. We're supposed to be part of this rescue work. We're supposed to be part of the rescue work, not in dealing with natural disasters, but actually going out and trying to rescue people from this impending unnatural disaster called Armageddon. We're supposed to be going out, rescuing them, saving their lives. So they must be thinking to themselves, when they see devastation and there's bereavement and loss and some people have lost their whole family, they must be thinking to themselves is, tell me, who rescues the rescuers? Why does this happen? Why, why has my family been destroyed by this natural disaster? Uh, and what Stephen Lett tries to do, therefore, is when these people may be obviously at this point doubting their faith, because they're told that when be one, once they become a Jehovah's Witness, they're afforded some sort of protection. And in some cases, they go to the, the natural place where they think they will be afforded mega protection, is the Kingdom Hall. And of course, the Kingdom Hall's roof's fallen down on them, and, they, and, and they've died. You know, there's no protection at all. So they must wonder where the protection is. So what Stephen Rubberface Lett is trying to do here is he is trying to then say, to sort of placate these people, so that they don't lose their faith, and say to them, right, okay, don't blame Jehovah God. Don't blame Jehovah God, it's not his fault. Put the blame unfairly and squarely with Satan the devil. If Satan hadn't have done what he did, then Jehovah would have had a more closer uh, relationship with humans and might have been bothered to protect them against natural disasters that's what he's saying that's what he's saying and of course he's saying that man men under the rulership of satan have um polluted the air and therefore have changed the uh, the global climate which are is, is creating more natural disasters so basically it's not god's fault it's satan's fault and it's, it's, it's man's fault under the rulership of Satan. The question which Stephen Lett fails to address, and this is the, the, the one which really would love the answer to Stephen more than any other, is why are there natural disasters in the first place? If you're saying that because God uh, no longer has a relationship with, with man, allegedly, um, he doesn't afford his protection in natural disasters, you have to say to yourself is why are there natural disasters in the first place. Now, if you do a Wikipedia search on natural disasters, it, it's, a, it's a broad umbrella which encompasses things like tornadoes, um, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, um, you know, that sort of stuff, and, uh, and hurricanes, and you know, basically anything which kills a lot of people, a natural disaster. And you have to see to yourself as why are the natural disasters? Now I'm going to just pick, um, and I've picked this one particular form of natural disaster um, for a particular reason, which we'll get back to. But that's volcanic eruptions. Okay, volcanic eruptions. Now the thing about it is, volcanic eruptions aren't a modern phenomena. You know, vol there, are, there are dormant volcanoes all over this earth. Volcanoes were erupting before there was life on this planet. And if we're led to believe that God created this planet, we have to, and then ticked off the very stages that they were good, the earth's crust, good, water, good. You have to think, therefore, that he must have deliberately created um, volcanic activity. And even in Scotland, there is a dormant volcano <laughs> in of all places, Edinburgh. If you go to the if you go to the capital of Scotland, and never you always used to be the capital of Scotland. But if you go to the capital of Scotland in Edinburgh, if you go if you go see if you're on top of uh, Edinburgh Castle, and then you look to your if you look south, there's a great big odd uh, shaped looking hill which is called Arthur's Seat. I call it Arthur's Bottom. And it's Arthur, apparently after King Arthur, 
uh, of who we know actually didn't probably exist. But anyway, it's called Arthur's Seat, and that is the remains of a volcano. So in other words, there's dormant volcanoes all over this earth. And then you get some dormant volcanoes which all of a sudden, for no rhyme or reason, just blow their top. And then you get other volcanoes which have been steadily, you know, belching out lava and, uh, you know, rocks and sulfur, you know, for whatever, for a hell of a long time. For probably thousands of years, from probably before the time that there were any living creatures on this earth. Now, when God was taking off his, his, his own handiwork in relation to the earth, and I have dwelt on this before on another video, um, Sorry, it wasn't good. You know, if there, were, if there was a building control committee at that time, you know, maybe a bunch of angels, and when God was, says, right, okay, I, I've ticked it off as, as good, I'm now going to crack on and put living things on this earth now, obviously nobody dared say to God, oh, sorry, but we think it's a really, really bad idea. For instance, if God had... Um, created a housing project and you would have got planning control or building control gone in to just to make sure that they were you know the buildings were safe and discovered hold on a second there's, there's, there's cracks in the floor here you know the foundations were really dodgy uh, that will potentially lead to the, the roof falling down on people it's just not safe to put people in sorry Jehovah God that we're going to maybe put it onto a better builder you know this guy called Satan the devil thinks he can do a better job um, and then uh, Jehovah says to the building guys, how much will it cost for you to approve it? Oh, okay, now you're talking my language. So apparently, apparently Jehovah ticked off that the, the earth was good and it was fine to put living things on it first, the, well, we had the plants, the animals, and then of course humans. Well, it wasn't fine at all because volcanic activity has been devastating the, uh, the animal kingdom and the human race for thousands of years and there's a knock-on effect from this now the reason why I've chosen volcanic activity more than the the other ones is because the when you have a, an earthquake um, it usually impacts that area you know where, where you get the the center where there's the worst devastation uh, and the other side of the earth there's no problem at all you, you won't even know it's happened same with a hurricane or, or tornado or whatever you know there may be a hurricane over in the Caribbean and we'll get a lot of shit uh, rain maybe a week later in Britain but we'll get nothing of the effects of a hurricane with volcanic activity it's, it's completely different uh, I'm going to go back on some of the, the the key volcanic eruptions so I'm now having to read from something set up on my laptop here so I'm going to uh, uh, this is some of the worst volcanic eruptions ever okay so we're to think now right now that these are natural disasters and and how uh, and yeah, I've got to ask you a question: Why do volcanic uh, eruptions occur and the devastation that they have? Right. Okay. In 1815, there was an eruption in a place called Mount Tambor in, in Indonesia, and uh, it claimed the lives of 120,000 people. It blew uh, volcanic ash 40 uh, kilometers into the sky. It was the most powerful eruption of 500 years. Upon entering the ocean, the force of the pyroclastic flow caused the creation of a series of towering tsunamis. Thanks to the, amount, the enormous amount of SO2 emitted, the world, the, world, the world experienced a severe temperature drop that led to global, global crop failures. Thousands starved to death in China, while typhus spread across Europe. In the two years after the explosion, the price of grain in Switzerland more than quadrupled. That's, that's, you know, two years after this volcanic eruption. So you can see, therefore, that when a volcano explodes, it doesn't just affect that area. It can affect the whole world. It can, it can stop the sun getting through and therefore lowering the temperature and resulting in the failure of crops. We'll go on to another one. Now, this one I, I didn't know of. Uh, Krakatoa, Indonesia, again, 1883. is one of the most violent eruptions of recent human history, completely destroying the island in which it resides. Um, Krakatoa's final eruption was four times, four times more powerful than the largest bomb that humans have ever detonated. 
Um, it's airways, you can imagine this sonic boom from this, it's airways travelled seven times around the world. It produced a series of tsunamis that devastated the region, killing around 36,000 people, destroying whole villages. Um, I'm not going to eruptions that have occurred since 1914, because a lot of people think, therefore, that they, that constitutes the signs of the times and that the you know that you know this is not the times. These aren't signs of living last days. These have happened <laughs> before 1914. There was a there's a there, there was a volcanic eruption in 1783 in Iceland. It was called Lakey or or a lake. I'll go for Lakey. Um, apparently, it lasted eight months. Toxic gases poisoned crops, killed 60% of the Iceland's grazing livestock. Um, the the SO2 um, released the air caused acid rain and glo global temperatures to drop. The eruption resulted in a famine that killed over 10,000 Icelandic people, roughly a quarter of the population at that time. Uh, the toxic eruption travelled south, it killed 23,000 in Britain, caused a famine in Egypt. And some environmental historians believe that the European famine caused by this eruption may have been the catalyst for the French Revolution. Absolutely fascinating. Right, let's see if there's another one here. Um, Mount Pili, Caribbean, 1902. Um, it's, it was believed to be dormant. It exploded. Hot gas, volcanic debris destroying the, the entire city of Saint-Pierre. I, I know this one, of the 28,000 people living at St. Pierre, only two survived. And I think one of them <laughs> was, was, he survived because he was in the jail. I think that's the case of the guy surviving the jail, which is often used by Jehovah's Witnesses, but bizarrely, that, that that's how I know about that one. Um, let's see if there's another one. Uh, one in El Sal Salvador, uh, 450 AD, so that's what, 1500 years ago. Um, it's the largest volcanic eruption in the last 200,000 years. It was so large it's thought to have destroyed several million cities. The skies were filled with ash and dust for more than a year. The eruption is, to, is estimated to have killed up to 100,000 people, displaced more than 400,000. It is thought to be in the cause of the global cooling of AD 535, 536, which led to crop, crop failures from Rome to China. Um, Mount Onze in Japan, 1792. It remains Japan's most deadliest volcanic eruption. It collapsed the dome of the volcano, creating a massive landslide that buried the city of Shimabara and flowed into the ocean, triggering a tsunami 57 meters high. The catastrophe killed about 15,000 people. Let's go on another one. Um, no, that's modern. That's modern. Oh yeah, um, Mount Vesuvius. I've been to Mount Vesuvius. And I've been to Pompeii and Herculaneum. I've been to these places and I've seen the schools of the people who were just standing at, 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 the, at what at that point would have been where the boats would have been that got in, they got caught up with the, with the with choked on the on the ash that was that's getting spewed into the air. And I've also been to Pompeii and seen also those the sort of plaster cast of the, of the people who just lay on the floor and, and suffocated to death, not burned to death, but suffocated to death. Or sometimes they, you know, the inside of, of breathing in this hot ash, they just, you know, burnt the lungs off. So Mount Vesuvius erupted, it's erupted um, in, in this time period as well. But let's go back to uh, 79 AD. So it's only 79 years after the birth of Christ, and only what, 46 years after Pentecost uh, of uh, 33 CE. So, um, Mount Vesuvius has erupted several times in history. The most terrifying eruption was 79 AD, um, 24th of August. The the Vesuvius erupted ash, mud, toxic gases, completely destroying the nearby cities. The eruption killed 16,000 people. It took until 1595, <laughs> which is a hell of a long time for the cities to be evacuated today. And what you've got to think as well, that maybe in, in Pompeii or Herculaneum, there may have been the burdening starts of a, of a little congregation of Christians who, uh, the, who's heard of the congregations of Pompeii? Nobody, because they all died. So I think that's it from there. Yes, it is. Oh, there was one, uh, one more 1902. So we'll just, we'll just bring this one in. Uh, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, this was in Santa Maria in Guatemala. Uh, 1902, this um, dormant volcano erupted. It killed 5,000 people, though many believe that the, that number is is uh, higher than that. 
the ash from the eruption dog in the skies of Guatemala for days and spread all the way to San Francisco. Now what's not on this, on this is one that's one of the most famous volcanic eruptions. If you ever go to Greece, there's, a, there's an island called uh, Santorini. And, and Santorini is just really the sort of, the out, the out, the sort of crater <laughs> of a volcano. In fact, the whole of the volcano, you can actually see the volcano is full of water. And the, when, when, the, when the Santorini volcano exploded, the tsunamis devastated the Greek islands and the culture or the empire that time um, were, were, were destroyed. Um, it, it's uh, the, the, Minoan, the Minoans and they sort of came and went and they just disappeared quickly and the reason why they're supposed to have disappeared is because it's believed that the tsunamis just de devastated their civilization. In fact, that's where they believe the stories of Atlantis comes from, from the, um, from the volcano at Santorini. So what do we learn here? Well, we learn quite clearly that, sorry, uh, Stephen Rubberface life, the question has to be asked, not why, not why God doesn't protect us from the effects of volcanoes, it's why volcanoes for a kickoff have been uh, allowed to blow their tops and erupt since the dawn of man, killing thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Why does that happen? When you, when you consider also um, um, vol uh, earthquakes that happen out at sea that, call, that, that create tsunamis, they again kill thousands and thousands of people. Because the plates of the earth, because the, the planet earth is not stable. It has never been stable. It was never good, let's tick it off and put people there. It never was stable. So you can't blame Satan. You can't blame Satan. You have to blame the guy who made the earth and then decided to put people on it. If it was good, volcanoes would have probably never been created, created in the first place. They would have lied dormant before thousands of million years before that he decided to put people on board. That's the way it goes. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that obviously as well, that the, the let refers to the change in weather climate by the crap that humans under the control of, uh, of Satan put into the air. As we've just seen from those reports there, that when volcanic ash and sulfur and all that crap and gases flows up into the air, this causes more pollution of the air and changes the, the climate of the whole earth more than man has ever done by a natural disaster created by Jehovah God. Yes, the God of the Bible, the loving God of the Bible, he, he has, he is the source of the natural disasters, you would think that when he all of a sudden he realised that it's, it, oh, those volcanoes, shit. Oh man, the earth's cross, I've, I've, oh, I forgot all about it. I thought, I thought I'd sort it. Right, I, I, I don't want to see anybody die. I'm, I'm going to really do my best to protect these people from the effects of natural disasters. But hey ho, he doesn't bother. Now, the interesting thing is, is in relation to weather. This is a bit of a bit, this is a little bit of a grey area of who controls the weather. It's a little bit of a grey area because I kid you not, um, I've been to my fair share of outdoor district convention at football grounds or rugby grounds in England and in Scotland. Um, needless to say, <laughs> we weren't particularly blessed with nice weather, and it would be particularly. Um, the people out there who were probably, the, it was the worst affected ones were the poor sisters who'd make a real deal with their hair and trying to look nice and attractive because they looked in their own congregation and went, you know, realised they've got to pick a life partner, an everlasting life partner from these bunch of young men and decided Oh my God, no. And then, of course, they go to their, their circuit assemblies with a little bit of enthusiasm and they look around and go, Oh my God, definitely not. And the district convention is that big chance to make an input, have a, a greatest uh, impact that they can um, catch, catch a fish, only for them not be able to show how lovely they look, their lovely dress and their, their hair nice and their makeup because it's pissing down with rain. But... On the days it wasn't pissing down rain, maybe it's the first day of the convention, and you would get a brother who would, in prayer, as everybody is closing their eyes, you know, hanging onto this, you know, this speaker's every word, he'd definitely say, because I remember these words myself, 
we'd like you we'd like to thank you Jehovah <laughs> for for providing us with this lovely day today we we have been blessed we have been blessed with the lovely weather that you have provided to us so hold on a second what what were we saying here are we saying what the brother and this is not once or twice this happened many times that if it's a nice day and they still say, say, Jehovah's really blessed us today. So in other words, the inference that is there, that Jehovah has controlled the weather, the blue sky and the sun, to make sure it's high pressure, not a low pressure, or whatever it is, to ensure that the brothers at this outdoor convention are enjoying wonderful weather, he's controlling it. Now, um, <laughs> the next day, when it's pissing down with rain, you don't get the guy in his closing prayer saying, we, we, we'd, we'd just like to, we'd all like to wonder, Jehovah, why you haven't blessed us today. Why you decide to allow it to be pissing down with rain. Um, what's going on? What the fuck? You know, for some reason, they never mention it. No, it's a bit, it's a bit like similar to going up to a complete stranger with, with, with a cake, with a cake. <laughs> if God has nothing to do with the weather, it's like going up to, to a guy with a cake and just going to a complete stranger and say, thanks very much for the cake. And the guy goes, I don't know what you're on about. Yeah, thank you for the cake. Oh, what, what a great job you've done on the cake. And the guy goes, look, I don't know who you are. And I, I, I definitely didn't make that cake. Yeah, but I'm thanking you for the cake anyway. I, I know you're responsible for it. Look, I'm not responsible for making the cake. I tell you what, even if I'd made you that cake, it wouldn't be that cake because I can't stand chocolate cakes. I wouldn't have even made that cake. And then the guy just says, but thank you anyway. And this is the same thing. Why if God has now d d distanced himself from controlling the weather, and has nothing to do with the weather at all, why are we thanking him when it's a sunny day? Because it's just completely and utterly random. But apparently Jehovah's Witnesses, when it's a sunny day and it allows them to do this and do that and do the other, they all always attribute the nice weather with, with, with their God. It's bizarre. And then when it's pissing down with rain, it clearly must be Satan's fault. It's clearly, oh dear, maybe they're taking turns. Right, Satan, over to you. I'll control the weather on a Thursday. You've got it on Friday, whatever. It's bizarre. It's really bizarre because what Stephen Rubber-Faceless is trying to say is that basically God, <laughs> God has placed no part in the weather system we see today. But then you get other people who, who then say it's a nice day. Well, clearly, well, you know, we're, we're to praise Jehovah for giving us this fine weather. Which way is it, Stephen? Which way is it? You, so in other words, you allow nice weather when people don't want to get their hair wet and want to do some do whatever it is, a convention. But when it comes to saving people's lives, then God can't be asked with the weather. Now, the interesting thing is, this, who controls the weather? This came up on my, uh, I'm part of one of these, well, various different uh, Facebook ex witnessy sites. And in mind, I was wanting to have this discussion. <laughs> they actually, bizarrely, I was actually going to mention this, but, but without me having to search for it, somebody has done the job for me last night. You know, I was going to go there, so, so clearly this is Jehovah's direction, because as we always know, coincidences when it comes to God are not coincidences. But anyway, this must be Jehovah's direction. Whenever you see any pictures of um, the spectacular slaughter that's going to go down at Armageddon, all of a sudden God, who's decided not to control the weather to save people's lives, Bizarrely, when it comes to destroying people's lives, he has full control. Well, let's look at this, if you can remember some of these. Look at that picture there. Do you see that picture there? Do you see what's going on? See what's going on? Yes, that's, uh, it's earthquakes, natural disasters. It's um, lightning coming out the sky and massive great big hailstones the size of tennis balls that God is using the natural elements of this earth to kill people is, is, is two more. Do you see that? Two more pictures there. Clearly that looks like all the sulfur and stone that's firing out from a volcanic eruption. It looks like there may be water on the, 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 the road there for maybe a tsunami. And here again, we've got volcanic ashes falling from the sky. Let's crack on to another one. 
Oh yes, there we go. More volcanic activity spurting forth from a volcano. Just see it all there. There'll be fireballs coming down there. Um, there's another one there. Yeah, that's a cracker. There's all Jehovah's happy people leaving as, of course, you get fire and sulfur in the background and bolts of lightning. And uh, finally, this one here, I always remember this picture. Here we have um, people drowning. Do you see that's people drowning round about there? People are drowning there. So that's from a tsunami. And uh, as well as drowning from the water, obviously they've got a lot of fire from maybe more vol volcanic uh, activity. So isn't it bizarre, isn't it bizarre that, 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 that all of a sudden Stephen Rubber Facelight is saying that, that God doesn't really control the elements of the earth. But my God, when it comes to punishing people and killing people, he is so hands-on, it's incredible. He's just getting really stuck in. Yeah, hailstones the size of tennis balls. Bring back the, you know, lightning, let's kill them. Tsunamis, you know, volcanic explosion, earthquakes, just let's use those elements, tornadoes and hurricanes. Let's just go to town and kill seven billion people. I'm controlling the weather now, but when it came to trying to save the lives of 62, 64 people through natural disasters, when it came to actually preserving lives of people who were going to go out and, and be involved in the work of trying to preserve other lives, I couldn't be asked. The thing is about this, more than anything else, is that what Stephen Rubberface let doesn't do is actually consult his Bible. He's come out with this sort of Oh, Satan's to blame, Satan's to blame. But sorry, Stephen, because when you go back to that thing called the Bible, which allegedly you base all your teachings from, when you look at the Bible and look at what God has done <laughs> with natural disasters, guess what? He's all over it. You know, and this is post um, the God of Eden. It's, it's, it's post the sort of distance that he put between the relationship between himself and humankind. Jehovah still decides to control the elements. And what examples do we have of this? Well, the, the biggest example of controlling the elements is, of course, <laughs> my favourite, the flood. When he, when he allowed it to rain for 40 days and 40 nights and, and committed the greatest act of animal cruelty that's ever been recorded, you know, uh, involving the death of billions of animals all over the world and a select small um, number of humans who could have just dealt with by you know using one angel so there's that and then we can then go on you know onto the the plagues in egypt using the rods of moses and aaron and the plagues many of those plagues can be attributed to a natural disaster created by God. We had the one of the, the plagues was, I believe, giant, giant hailstones coming out the air, killing all the Egyptians and livestock or anybody outside their house. Just, just killing. Again, see, it's a shame these animals. The animals are always first to get it. So, yet again, more cruelty by Jehovah God as all these massive hailstones came down and wiped a lot of them off. There was also, very similar to volcanic eruption, there was the darkening of the skies. You know, there was no light and obviously crops would fail there as well. There was the poisoning of the water where it, well, it didn't really turn to blood, but obviously there was, there was you know, obviously pouring the water and so people couldn't drink the water. And then, of course, there were all the odd things which happened with the gadflies and the frogs and all that nonsense. But anyway, you can see some of the, uh, the plagues which God was responsible for. He created natural disasters. In other words, he was controlling the weather there again. And when you crack on through the Bible, there's numerous examples of Jehovah ensuring that it doesn't rain, thereby thereby creating a famine to on purposely starve people, to punish them, starve people. He created, he controlled the weather, no rain, no crops, famine, death. So where does it stop? So in other words, it, apparently, you know, Jehovah God only uses the elements of this world and creates natural disasters. He creates natural disasters to kill people. He's been doing it from day one and will do it in spectacular form at Armageddon. And when it comes to protecting people today from natural disasters which occur naturally, not by him causing it, by volcanic eruptions and earthquakes, he doesn't offer any protection at all to his chosen people. 
The thing about it is, more than anything else, is that let's just doing this to just let Jehovah God off the hook here, and it, it's, it does my head in. I would love, I would love the opportunity to speak one-to-one -one with Stephen Rubberface later and just say, look, you know, let's, let's just talk, uh, uh, like men, let's talk about this logically, let's use some common sense, and, and let's try and, you know, talk about um, who's to really blame for, the, for deaths in natural disasters. You know, let's just talk about it. And I know what would happen. You wouldn't turn up for the meeting. <laughs> but the thing is that people can't avoid the questions of the carters, the Jehovah's Witnesses in the street who maybe come to your door or they're out in the street and then you actually face them with that question and say, look, who really is to blame for natural disasters? Who's in control of the weather? And then when you, when you hit them with facts like I, I've just given, when you talk to them and, and, and talk common sense to them, they realise they don't have a leg to stand on in, in, in any longer supporting either what Stephen Letts says or in fact the actions of the God of the Bible. Unfortunately, it won't deter them from believing in, in the governing body, in Jehovah's Witnesses, in the Bible, in this God, because as I've said before in other talks, their fear that man has of dying. We want to believe that there's an afterlife. We want to believe this isn't all we have. We want to believe that we'll be, jo we'll be joining our dead relatives, either in heaven or on earth. So we basically turn a blind eye when it comes to really saying who's responsible for the deaths of thousands and thousands of people and now it must be into the millions who's responsible for the death of millions of people who've died through the past 6,000 years of man's history from the effects of natural disaster and that is fairly and squarely with the creator of this earth Jehovah God if we ought to believe he did make it and the fact that he still has the power to control the elements of the earth, the weather patterns of this earth, to m make sure there are no natural disasters and chooses not to. Anyway, there's my thoughts. <laughs> if you want to leave any comments, that's uh, up to you. But uh, thanks for being there and listening and see you on the next subject. Bye-bye.